But good morning. If you don't know who I am, my name is John Sparrow. I, I actually see, serve as lead pastor here at Equippers Central Coast. Oh, you can leave that in. Uh, you can bring that thing right back in. Thank you. It's, it's, uh, give it up for the screen guy. Um, we had a request from someone that their eyes see it better. Cool. So we do that. It's just the kind of people we are, man, just here to serve, you know. Um, but anyways, I'm just going to talk for the next few moments uh, around the subject of baptism because today is Baptism Sunday. We're so excited. And uh, what I just want to say is we have seven people signed up so far that are going to be baptized today. But I want you to know that throughout my message, if the Lord stirs something on the inside of you to be baptized, the, the pool's open. The opportunity is there. Uh, our belief is that when salvation comes, the next step is baptism. And so I'm going to explain what that means what it uh, actually implies biblically for us as believers, but you have to know that the opportunity is welcome. Throughout Scripture, you see these suddenlies happen. Uh, That's a whole different message, but uh, when eyes are open, the next step is baptism. I remember a few years back, I was at Andrini's Coffee Shop in the village uh, doing a little Bible study, and uh, a guy was there uh, who didn't really know the Lord and was having this Bible study. His eyes were just open, and he began to ask questions, and we prayed with him, uh, to receive Jesus as a Savior, and then he asked us, you know, what, how can I be baptized? We're like, hey, well, man, it's going to be about three months. you got to sign up. No, no. We're like, hey, man, there's a creek right down the road. And we literally walked down to the Rio Grande Creek and baptized him in the creek right there and then. And so, um, and so uh, if you're new here, just really glad that you're with us today. We're going to spend a, a few moments studying the Bible Uh, We believe that the Bible is the infallible word of God, that it is true, it's living, it's alive. It's forming us into God's image so that we don't form God into our image. It defines what flourishing looks like. It gives us a glimpse into the beautiful plan that God has to actually forgive us of our sins, to release his plan and destiny over our lives. And so I would just ask that you would open your hearts to the word of God today. My prayer since January 1 of this year is that, God, just how we encounter you in worship through music, which we love, God, would we encounter you through your word? Would it become alive and breathing, sharper than a two-edged sword to divide what's of our flesh and what's of the spirit? And so we're going to get into that. But we do have some uh, rules around here, some really strict rules, Um, like little things like if one person claps, everyone has to clap, okay? So that's like... It's obviously not for me, right? It's like for other people who preach here because uh, I'm, I don't need it. Uh, it just helps. It's just, yeah. yeah. But then let's uh, contain ourselves. And uh, we haven't even started yet, man. It's about to get really good. Um, but uh, baptisms, uh, no, 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 no. We have another rule is that don't, don't do that. So two rules, but rules are meant to be broken. Uh, baptisms are, are one of two sacraments uh, that we carry. Um, uh, hey, Dale, actually there was someone who needed something out in the lobby. And so if you could just kindly attend to their needs, that would be super helpful. Thank you. <laughs> That's amazing. I love that. That's so good. Um, <laughs> What if it was like when one person cries, everybody cries? What if we made that rule? Okay, mine's wandering, we're digressing, and it's Dale's fault, but here we go. Um, as Christians in our Christian faith, there's, there's really primarily two sacraments that we practice here at Equivers Church, two outwards ex, outward expressions of the grace of God that's been revealed. And those two sacraments that we celebrate and observe here at this church are the sacrament of communion, uh, which next Sunday we'll be taking communion together as a body And uh, that is an outward sign of a grace that's been extended to us. We eat of the flesh of God in the person of Jesus and drink of his blood, uh, which sounds like cannibalism, but it is really uh, the way that God has made his grace obvious in this, that he sent his one and only son, Jesus, to die a sinner's death on the cross. We remember that his body was beaten and it was broken and that his blood was spilled out. So when we take communion, we remember the grace that's been extended. Baptism is another outward sign or sacrament that we practice, and I, I love this, this quote. 
it says God does not want us to be in the dark about whether we have received grace or not. He doesn't want to leave us in the dark. So when we take communion, when we observe baptism, it's an obvious sign. It's an outward, tangible expression of the grace that's been given towards us. And we explain baptism as simply an outward declaration of an inward decision. It's like the marriage band when you get married. It is an expression that you've made a decision. So I'm going to get to the Bible. Uh, we're going to go to Romans chapter 6. But before we do, I want you to exp- uh, understand this was written by a man named Paul. Um, Paul was formerly Saul. He persecuted Christians. He would later in Scripture say that he was the chief of all sinners. He was really good at being bad. Anybody really good at being bad? But you're in church, man. Uh, I've been really good at being bad before. And Paul says that he's the chief sinner. And uh, Paul was actually, uh, his life was transformed. He was knocked off a horse. His eyes were blind for three days. And when he awoke, Jesus appeared and revealed to him that he was now going to have this mission or this mandate to be the very, very voice and apostle to the early church. He was transformed from, from Saul to his name now Paul. And he's speaking here to a church in Rome. And the church in Rome was living in extreme persecution. There was extreme opposition to the gospel of Jesus. They were uprooting all kinds of social norms, political norms. And so Paul's writing this letter to encourage these people in their opposition to keep strong in the faith, to keep going, to not shrink back. And he's helping them to understand an entirely new way to live. So are you ready for some scripture? You ready? This is Romans 6, 1 through 14. This is Paul writing to the Romans. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may have a new life. He's thankful for a new life. For we have been united with him in a death like his. We will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with. That we would no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we die with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once and for all. Someone say once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any parts of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been instruments of righteousness, brought from death to life, and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. I love verse 14. For sin shall no longer be your master. Because you're not under law, but under grace. Everyone said amen to the word of the Lord. Um, This is a really packed passage. There's a lot of places we could go here theologically in our understanding. But I want to remind you that we're primarily honing in on the subject of baptism. And I think it's really important to know why you do what you do. Or why you believe what you believe. I get so concerned sometimes uh, when we just believe anything we hear and say anything we thought we were supposed to believe. It's just transferred as truth. And what I hope to do is through Romans chapter 6 is to give us a great context of why we actually believe in baptism. Why we believe that as Christians we have this opportunity for new life in Jesus. And so we got to go way back. We actually have to go all the way back uh, to the Garden of Eden and the book of Genesis in the beginning and Eden, this is going to help us understand, that word Eden, it actually means pleasure. Eden means pleasure. So God, in all his creativity and intentionality, he, he created this beautiful landscape, this place that was intended for pleasure. But one thing was missing was man to dwell with him in that garden. So he created man in his own image, and from Adam's rib, he created Eve, and you may be familiar with the story, but here are two individuals in perfect paradise, the place called pleasure. God opens up the floodgates for them to do what he called them to do, 
to be fruitful and multiply, to steward the ground, to work it, to have dominion. I mean, this is the ideal scenario for human beings to flourish. I don't know about you. I, I've never seen any of those reality dating shows, but I've heard about them. Anybody watch reality dating shows? I do. Um, <laughs> can we talk to Bachelor for a minute? Um, or Bachelorette, whatever your preference is, or Bachelor in Paradise, whatever it is. I've just heard about this stuff. I've just heard about it. Um, but I, I, my wife sometimes watches those things. She indulges herself occasionally, uh, just twice a year when the season's on, you know. And uh, I watch these things. I'm like the skeptic, you know. I'm like, this is ridiculous. Of course you can fall in love on the back of a yacht in the south of France, Right? <laughs> This is so dumb. This is like an isolated experiment. They have a private chef. You know, like, who couldn't fall in love with anybody in that situation? You know, like, I'm, I'm just there. I'm just there for it. I'm just really happy to be on a boat in the south of France. You know, this is, this is ridiculous. It's not real life. Um, you know, you, you just start thinking, and, and she gets to know. I'm like, like they're, what about their bills? Like, what are these people doing? is it like life continue while they're on this TV show? Like, don't they realize that they have to go back to reality? Like, this guy's going to wake up with bad breath. He probably doesn't clean his room. Like, what is this girl thinking? <laughs> it's an ideal scenario. But what I want us to realize is that God in his goodness in the Garden of Eden created the perfect scenario for people to flourish. There was nothing hindering. They didn't experience shame. It was so good, they actually were walking around naked. They just had all they needed in themselves and of themselves and with God and his presence. It's a place of, pre of pleasure. So this is a really good thing, but if you continue in the story in Genesis chapter 2, after we hear, you know, they're both naked, walking around, and there was a, a serpent who was crafty. He was cunning, and, and God had instructed Adam, Adam and Eve to eat of anything. So they're in this perfect place all you can eat, but there's one thing God asks, is not to eat from this one tree, because if you eat from this one tree, it's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It's this inward draw to human pride to be like God. And he said, just don't eat of that one. But here comes a serpent who's crafty, and he begins to question the word of God. I mean, you know that the enemy can't create, but he'll always manipulate. Did God really say is that really the promise? And so here comes the serpent to manipulate what God had said. And sure enough, Eve takes some of the fruit. She eats of it and shares it with her husband. And into the world enters sin. And the, the saddest story maybe in all of Scripture is when Adam and Eve make a mistake and they look at each other. And the Bible says that they realize that they're naked. Shame comes. It enters the equation by man's decision to be like God in his own pride. And, and they, they sewed together fig leaves and they made coverings for themselves. And then the Bible says that God was walking in the garden in the cool of day and they hid from him in the trees of the garden. They went from perfect uh, utopia to now hiding in the bushes, afraid of the one who had given them everything. And God in verse nine, he says, where are you? I heard you in the garden, I was afraid. So I hid, Adam said. And God said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat? And it continues on where God begins to let them know of the consequence of their own action. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat fruit from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until the return to the ground. Since from, you, from, from it you were taken from dust, you are in dust, you will be t return. And so the Lord actually banished Adam and Eve out of this garden, and he placed these flaming swords at the entrance of Eden to guard the tree of life in the garden. So we see this beautiful, perfect situation God and his generosity gives us, and then we see sin enter into the equation. Sin is defined as human activity that is contrary to God's will. Sin is any deviation from a divinely revealed will. How many know that God has a will for our lives? He has good intentions for our lives. It's nothing but pure and holy and good and for our benefit. But sin is the deviation from that. It's, a, it's actually the source of evil. It's the source of corruption and death and is what humanity and all of creation must be saved from, according to Scripture. 
I just want to say, I, I know we're getting into some fundamental things, but we hold this core belief that sin is the issue. It's the thing that is upheaving and upholding anything that is uh, 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 in favor of the will of God in our world. It's, it's, it's the world, it's, it's the flesh, it's the devil, it's this conglomeration of things that are raging against God. And so we have to actually form like a, a yuck towards it. Like, I don't want that life. I don't want to be a participant in the things that separate me from the perfect life that God has for me. I don't want that for my children. I don't want that for my family. And I'm not, I'm not standing in judgment and pointing fingers and yelling. And No, it just grieves me that sometimes we choose a will that is contrary to God's. It grieves me. But it's all of our story. It's, this definition would say it's the fundamental unbelief, distrust, and rejection of God. And human displacement of God as the center of reality. The Bible presents sin as both fallen humanity's state of separation and alienation from God. And as a person's purposeful disobedience to God's will as evidenced in concrete thought or act. As an inherent part of the human condition, sin is universal. And it is both corporate and individual. And Romans would say that therefore just as sin entered the world through one man. In death through sin, and in this way, death came to all people because all sinned. And I want to start my message this way because I think in order to understand some good news, you have to understand the bad news. We, we live our lives based on the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of God. This word good news was uh, stolen, really, from secular culture, that when a battle was won, uh, uh, a messenger would come to the territory that the military represented, and they would bring back good news of victory. And so in crafting scripture, what do we call the gospel? We call it good news. Why? Because there's been a battle that's been won on your behalf, where sin, hell, and the grave is defeated, and the messenger comes to tell us that there's victory in Jesus. It's good news. But in order to understand good news, you got to understand there's bad news. In ourselves, in our, our sinful condition, we were destined for death. But we're going to go back to Paul because he's really trying to help these people understand the gravity of their sin. And some people have this funny dynamic. Here, here's some more solid TV that I've been watching, okay? It's like confessional Sunday, maybe. Um, we don't have cable, but we, we love a good documentary. Any documentary watchers out there? I mean, that's like my preference these days. You know, documentaries like The Bachelor and, and no. <laughs> um, garbage. But there's this one, and, and, and there's some language in it, so I have to kind of preface that. And you guys have to understand, Lene and I, we don't actually watch rated R movies. You might call us old-fashioned, but we just don't. We don't watch rated R movies. We, we're really careful what comes into our home, the music we listen to, the stuff that's in our car that comes out of our mouth. And we just feel like that's beneficial for us to be careful what we're watching. And, um, but we'll watch a good documentary. And in those documentaries, sometimes there's language. So I just want to preface this, that this documentary has some language. It has some sensitive content. But it's this one called Cocaine Cowboys. Has anyone seen that? Cocaine Cowboys. It's fascinating. It's about these two young men in Miami who, who are just a pretty average uh, immigrants from Cuba. And, you know, they start to form this kind of ring, a network. And one time they come on this opportunity to make some money by, by selling drugs. It really wasn't their intention uh, they just wanted to. But one of the guys specifically was raised like a good old Catholic. And, it, and he really has like this conscience that's really pure, you know. He's like, but then he gets into this drug business, and they actually end up being the largest drug distributors like in U.S. history. Like just the thing just snowballs. But the, the fascinating thing throughout this documentary is that this guy has this, this, this conviction that I'm just going to keep going. But he had this deathly fear that if he got to the end of his life without repenting for everything he'd done, he'd go to hell. Like, it was this running thing. Like, I just need to make sure that before I die, well, there's just, just this moment, you know, this get out of hell free card that I can, you know, just punch in on that. He had, like, this fire insurance type of faith. It was really interesting what was running in the back of this guy's mind while he was wreaking havoc on the United States of America. He had this mindfulness. But it's almost like what Paul is addressing here in Romans 6. There were some people who were living their lives just, just on the line of what they could get away with uh, the, so that 
sin abounds so that grace could abound much more. You know, I'm just building a life of a testimony, but I know God's really good and he's really gracious so that when I repent, you know, I'll go to heaven, which is true. You can do anything you want. And by the grace and the good news of the gospel, if you repent and you turn in your heart, you are forgiven of your sin. Isn't that good news? But that's not the point. The point isn't to have fire insurance. (laughs) Paul's saying that the point is to enter into a new reality. It's not like the old you battling who you are until you go to heaven one day. He's saying, no, there's an opportunity here and now from what Jesus has paid for, that you can be dead to the old self. You can no longer just be playing with fire. How close can I get to the line? What can I get away with? How, how can I get through this life in a way that would you know, please my flesh, but then somehow end up with God? It's saying, no, that's not the truth. Jesus' grace isn't to be used as a way to proceed sinning so you can just keep receiving grace, although God's grace is that good. I want to be clear about that. But his audience in in Rome, they're just looking to micro at the situation. (laughs) They're just looking at one little tidbit of of a facet of God. They're caught in the weeds, but we're going to go back again in Scripture because Paul's really referencing like a way broader illustration of what baptism and new life are really like. So we're going to go back to the second book of the Bible, which is Exodus. And Exodus tells the story of how the children of of God or children of Israel, they were enslaved in Egypt unto Pharaoh. Uh, They were slaves that were forced to make bricks. It was a strenuous type of life. They were robbed of their religious freedoms and lived as slaves. And the beautiful thing about this is the Bible tells us that God actually heard them crying out in their misery of slavery. And, and God sent Moses to bring them out in a way to freedom in a promised land. They came through the Red Sea, leaving behind the land of slavery and discovering new freedom. And then God led them to Mount Sinai where they were given the law. And then they spent a bunch, like way too much time wandering <laughs> around the wilderness and just grumbling. They just weren't very thankful about what had happened. And he leads them. I mean, these, these people are so spoiled, you know, <laughs> like... God leads them out of slavery, and then they get through the, you know, the Red Sea, miracles happen, they have these tablets, they have this law, and then God keeps providing food, and then he provides, the Bible says that there's a pillar of fire by night that you just, just follow that, you know, it's just really easy, just follow the fire, and then in, there's a cloud by day, just follow that, and so they're just wandering in their own grumbling because their hearts were a little bit hard still, and what normally isn't recognized here in Romans that Paul actually tells a a version of the same story. Romans 6 describes how Christians came through water of baptism like the Red Sea, and they left behind the land of slavery, and they enter into a new freedom like leaving Egypt and setting off for the promised land. So the conversation isn't so much how far can I go and get away with it. No, the truth is Jesus offers an entirely new life. It isn't to stay in Egypt and see how free you could be in Egypt. He's like, no, 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 just get out of there. (laughs) Go away. I'm parting the Red Sea for you. I've done everything that you need. My grace is sufficient. My forgiveness is for I have done everything. Just walk through the Red Sea, and that's what baptism is. You are are immersed in water as a sign that you are dying to an old life of slavery to death, hell, hell in the grave, and raised to this new life in Christ of freedom, which is so beautiful. And the other um, part we have to understand about what Paul's saying here in the book of Romans is that a, a lot of the early Christians were looking for like a political exodus. We see this a lot through the letters that the early church is writing, is that people really thought, you know, that Jesus is going to ride in on this, you know, a chariot, and he's going to overthrow the throne. There's going to be a political upheaval that he's going to establish things with what their eyes could see. That it would be like a physical kingdom. These people were also looking for, uh, in, specifically in Rome, that God would overthrow the, the Roman government, and they would have this exodus from the slavery that they'd been living under. And and Paul, you know, he he agrees with that. You know, like I think that's good to hope for political freedom, but he translates all of this imagery into the ultimate freedom, the liberation of the whole cosmos from sin, corruption, and death. There's actually something deeper and more meaningful to be discovered here. And we've said this plenty about Paul, but Paul wrote most of his content from a prison cell. 
I, I remember going to Rome in 2017 with my wife and Josh and Michaela, and we had this amazing opportunity um, before we had kids, you know, and uh, life just got so much better after kids. I have to just say that. Uh, if you hear a tone around here that someone like rejoicing over the life before they had kids, can you just slap them and say, shut up, man, that's the biggest blessing you ever received. Those kids are of the Lord. Come on, he's blessed you to be fruitful and multiply. Just slap somebody. God bless you, man. Change your language. No, but, you know, before uh, we had kids, you know, we took two weeks and we traveled Europe and it was so cool. Uh, it was like about the last day. Uh, my dad happened to be in Rome at the same exact time because uh, every other year he goes to the Vatican. Uh, he serves with the Catholic Church on something called the Pontifical Council. And so, Pat, you know, Pat, uh, you guys don't understand this, but the guy is like a worldwide figure. And he just is like this humble guy around here. And so he sits around with people who represent the Roman Catholic Church globally. And uh, they have, they call them peace meetings. And so they, they develop documents and the whole thing started because the Catholic Church was really interested how non-denominational charismatic churches like us are growing at the most rapid rate of any denomination in the whole world without a, without a pope, bishops, cardinals, you know, without the structure that they have. They're like, how is this happening? And so in comes Pat <laughs> to explain to the Roman Catholic Church and a group of other people. He's the only one that doesn't have a PhD, though. Um, they call him the practitioner. Isn't that cool? Uh, everyone else knows some stuff in theory, but he can actually tell stories of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and, uh, and so he was there for those meetings. And it was really cool because that, how many know that, that Rome through those eyes is a lot different? We're seeing these upper meeting rooms throughout Vatican City where he would say, yeah, this is where we meet for prayer meetings with the Catholic Church. And uh, these are, you know, the, they own all this. And there's, there's little meeting rooms and, and housing facilities, and they put them up in these ancient little dorm spaces. It's beautiful. It's amazing. But one of the things we got to do is we got to go, uh, we saw the Colosseum. And then uh, just directly across from that, there's more ancient ruins. And at the very end of that procession, there is the prison cell of Peter and Paul. And so you look down in this disgusting, uh, there's like steps down. It's underground. It's dark. It's a little bit wet. At the time, it was actually closed off to walk in. But you could look through the, the, the prison bars to see where these men were chained and imprisoned in one of the most hostile environments that the world has ever seen. And you see that location, and you see where they were, and then you read their words in Scripture, and it's this reality that although on the outside they were chained, on the inside they were actually free. The inside, they had experienced the, the real exodus. God had delivered them from themselves. He had delivered them from the power of sin and hell and the devil. So as we wrap up, I'm going to go to Romans 6 again, 6 through 9. It says, For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. But if we died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. Amen. We know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he can't die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. If you hear anything today, I want you to understand that you have been set free. If we revisit the Exodus story a little bit, we're, was that a clap? <laughs> Here we go. There we go. Um, I needed that. Um, if we revisit that Exodus story, um, Stephen in Acts chapter 7 um, gives this discourse. If you want to read the whole Old Testament in one chapter, you can just read Acts chapter 7, okay? It's a little hack for you. Stephen gives this brilliant overview of where they come from, how they ended up there, and actually him giving an account in front of the ones who were about to stone him to death. He would be the first martyr, Stephen. And he's talking about how God had set them free from the prison in Egypt. But then in Acts 7.39, he says something really interesting. He said, but our ancestors refused to obey him. Instead, they rejected him and in their hearts turned back to God. To Egypt, sorry. They rejected God and in their hearts turned back to Egypt. I don't know if you understand the gravity of that statement. 
that God had delivered a people from the oppression of Pharaoh. They were in a different physical location, but there was something in their hearts that kept turning back to the slavery of Egypt. Somehow they preferred just being told what to do by their master. Some, some sick way about them just loved to be beaten and bruised and told what to do every day. They, they had some weird obsession with this bondage of slavery. And the whole reality was that the master there could care nothing about them. And so, hey, I've been talking to people who maybe have never walked into faith before. You've never made a decision to be baptized before. But just for a moment, can I talk to some Christians? Can I just explain this humbling principle to you? That you can take the slave out of Egypt, but sometimes you can't take Egypt out of the slave. That, yeah, we've been baptized, we've made a confession of faith in Jesus, we have said some things in theory, but in our hearts, there's still this attachment to the old way. There's still this attachment to our old selves, our old way of thinking and doing and being, but I just want to explain to you the reality of baptism. It, it's not like behavior modification. We don't do all this and pay all this money and rent theaters and ex extend ourselves beyond what should be humanly possible for people to like make you better. This isn't like a TED talk, self-help. This is not what we do. And I want to be very clear about that. No, because the reality is that we genuinely believe that if you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that he actually heals off the old to associate with himself, and he brings to life something brand new. You've been born again. He desires relationship. He desires relationship. And look, I... I I'm not like a relationship over religion necessarily person, I know, because I think religion's awesome. I think it's preserved a lot of our core beliefs over years of time. I think it's incredibly ignorant to just say, go away with religion. No, religion's actually really helpful, it's useful. We have to understand the church that's been established over thousands of years. It's a really healthy part of religion, but we have to understand that Jesus wants relationship. And sometimes, you know, we think that relationship is like this easy way, you know, like, you know, it's just relationship over religion, man. You don't got to do nothing. I'm like, dude, have you ever been in a relationship? <laughs> it's the hardest freaking thing you'll ever do. Relationship over religion is not some pass. <laughs> it's this. Relationship requires our hearts. Relationship requires in my marriage that my heart is turned towards my wife and not back to the way that I used to live. The amount of people that put on a wedding ring, they have the ceremony, and they walk into a season of marriage, but in their lives, they're still living single. Could you imagine? But so many times in our, in our faith, in our walk with Jesus, we've done the things, we've had the ceremonies, we've attended church, we've done all the jargon that we are supposed to do, but still, our hearts aren't given to them. Relationship is actually harder because it requires every little bit of us. And baptism is, it's like a type of public marriage ceremony. There was a day, September 14th, 2013, when I stood before my family and friends and I confessed before them my allegiance to my wife, Lene. It was a confession before my friends and family, but ultimately it was a covenant that was established before God. And in that ceremony, we received these rings. Mine was $19 because I was convinced I was gonna lose it any day. I still got that. 10 years later. That's worth clapping about. I was like, just give me the cheapest one, man. There's no way I'm gonna actually keep <laughs> I'm gonna lose that tomorrow. But anyways. And when I wear this ring, it's my big yes to my wife. It's my public declaration that I have made a commitment to somebody. One yes forever. That means a bunch of no's to a bunch of other stuff. That means I don't go to certain places. That means I don't watch certain things. I don't entertain certain conversations. I don't subscribe to certain mindsets because why? Oh, well, on September 14th, 2013, I, I made a decision. It made me new, put me into a whole new reality. And that is the beauty of baptism. The old is gone 
and the new has come. It's incredible what happens. I love Romans 6. I don't usually preach from the message version, but this is so well put by Eugene Peterson. He says this. He says, when we went under the water, we left the old country of sin behind. When we came up out of the water, we entered into the new country of grace. A new life and a new land, that's what baptism into the life of Jesus means. When we are lowered into the water, it is like the burial of Jesus. When we are raised up out of the water, it's like the resurrection of Jesus. Each of us is raised into a light-filled world by our Father. So we can see where we're going in our new grace-sovereign country. Could it be any clearer? Our old way of life was nailed to the cross with Christ. A decisive end to that sin-miserable life. No longer at sin's every beck and call. Isn't that beautiful? It's a new life. It's a new start. It's a new opportunity. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10 that if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you'll be saved. That word, that word would mean born again. Thanks so much for tuning in. We hope that that message was inspiring, encouraging, and hopefully equipped you for life. And if you're looking to get connected with Equippers Church, you can go to equipperscc.com slash connect, fill out a simple form, and someone from our team will be reaching out. You can find all kinds of opportunities to connect, to give, and receive prayer on our website, equipperscc.com. And hey, we really hope to meet you in person sometime, see you in the room. But until then, keep tuning in. We hope that you are blessed by Clippers Church here on YouTube. Love you so much. God bless.